been a pleasure to be here for the last two days. Um, so um, I'll refer briefly to these photos now because I probably won't have time to really talk about them in detail. The, um, the work that Anselm referred to, are these photos going to move? They should just, you know, they should just have a Ken Burns effect. They're not moving. Okay, well, if you could try to make them move, that would be great. So we could just cycle through them. So um, there's a work in the exhibition which is called uh, The Nucleus of the Great Union. And this work is based around um, um, 1,500 photographs that Richard Wright took when he went to the Gold Coast in the summer of 1953. Um, Black Power, the book he wrote in 1954, the book that was published in 1954, is an intensely um, controversial book for many reasons. It establishes a, a break with the kind of the kind of redemptionist narrative of the return to Africa. So it's a break with the kind of the whole Ethiopianist tradition of Garveyism. Um, it's also an intense kind of epistemological inquiry about the nature of modernity, modernization, modernism, the conflict between uh, what, at, what at the time people called the conflict between tradition and modernity. But um, it's, it's ultimately what we would now call um, a kind of a Promethean text in which Wright argues for the necessity to seize the, the human subject, the, the African subject as a kind of, um, as a plastic capacity. Uh, so in this sense, um, Wright is really arguing, arguing for prognostics more than a diagnostics. And I take that from Angela's brilliant talk yesterday. Um, so the work um, is based around the photographs that he took in 1953, which he wanted to include in the Black Power book, but which his publishers didn't want. I believe there was a small number published in the first British edition and the first Dutch edition, but then in further reprintings, they dropped away. So these photographs have been in the Beinecke Library at Yale since about 1970, when I believe um, the Richard Wright estate, Ellen Wright, deposited them there. So if you're part of Yale, if you're affiliated with Yale, you can get them online. But if, you, if you're not, you just can't. They're just locked. So we went to, I went to the Beinecke. And, uh, and when you're there, you can, um, you can order TIFFs and you can order JPEGs. And you can take photographs with your mobile phone. And you can do all kinds of things. So, um, so the work is based around um, some of those, a selection of those images. Um, and, uh, you know, hopefully one day these, the entire set will be released and they'll be able to travel to Accra, to Cape Coast, uh, to Ghana and to different parts of the continent. Um, so if there's time, I might talk about that a bit more at the end. But what I want to talk about is the, is the other thing I discovered while I was there, which I didn't know about really, which was... Um, the first draft of Black Power, which is, um, it's usually referred to as a travel journal. People go, oh, it's a travel journal. It's Wright's travel journal. I don't think it is. I think it's Wright's first draft for Black Power. It's more than a thousand pages. It's about a thousand and eighteen pages. Um, because Wright, he's already titling it. He's calling it The Pathos of Distance with the deliberate Nietzschean intensity there. He's calling it blood and tears. He's calling it um, the land of distance. He has a whole series of names. And, uh, and when you look at that, um, that first version of Black Power, so I, I, I basically uh, took photos in my mobile. I took the photos of the whole book over a day. So it's on my mobile, so if anybody you know, <laughs> wants to see it, if anybody's fanatic enough, come and join me. So. Um, so I think, I, think that's, I think that book, which is, is such a, a controversial book for so many reasons, so many people have a love-hate relation to it. And in a way, that book is a kind of, you can plot a path between 
that book in from 54 and Sadia Hartman's Lose Your Mother from 2007. That's like one long kind of trajectory, which we would now say is, um, we would now say that's a kind of Afro-pessimist trajectory because in that book, Wright confronts the kind of intramural um, antipathies, uh, uh, antagonisms, uh, the gaps, the incommensurabilities, the, uh, the hostilities between African Americans and between what would become Ghanaians. And Sidney Hartman's 2007 book, Lose Your Mother, for those who know it, in a way, to me, is, is kind of, is kind of the, 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 the key kind of text that responds back to right, but extends right in ways that he couldn't do. So uh, what I want to do is um, trace, um, in a way, a, a simple structure between um, Wright's um, communist moment, his anti-communist moment, and his, um, his you couldn't really call it a pan-Africanist moment, a nationalist moment. Um, so Anselm's timeline is a useful one. Um, so um, I'll start. So it starts with a quote from, from um, The Pathos of Distance. That's my favorite title for it. It is stupid hypocrisy to argue that one should discuss colonies temperately. A colony exists because of the intemperate nature of man. A colony is a corpus delecti. And by corpus delecti, he means, of course, the body of a crime. The colony is the body of a crime. So if the locations and the entanglements of the Cold War have in recent years been re-narrated beyond the binary division of the West and the East, beyond the division between Europe and the USA, beyond the USA and the USSR, and re-narrated in terms of what historians now call the global Cold War, then what confronts us today here is to narrate and to re-narrate the epistemological stakes and the ontological claims, the intergenerational import and the interscalar implications of this expanded terrain, a terrain in which the multiplied entanglements, the unintended outcomes, the unanticipated implications of the practices and the public's move in and on and through what we can now call the global cultural cold war. And this global cultural cold war is an expanded context. It's one that would speak to Alexander's, that great moment in Alexander's talk in which he pointed to the way in which India was, actually it wasn't Alexander, I think it was um, Nida. Nida's point that India was always already global. That speaks to that notion. Uh, an expanded context in which each and every new nation state in the continent, throughout the continents, throughout the Caribbeans and the Americas, engendered new centers, what Wright called new terrors in freedoms, what he called new post-mortem terrors. And these terrors in freedom, that's terror as in fear, not terror incognita, them. These terrors in freedom, they exceed the political geography of underdevelopment that is typically narrated as margin and center or center and periphery. In this expanded context, there are centers that decenter other centers and supposedly unknown figures such as Shanta Rao that Alexander referred to, these figures who were never not unknown who turned out to be critical figures, these figures, uh, or more, more, these figures are equally well known in sp specific political geographies that re-emerge in this expanded frame. And so from this dilatory context, 
from this surround, which is not a automatically democratic surround, but is a surround that is actively unstable. What I want to trace is the way in which Wright's writings, Wright's writings continually seem to engender disintegrative and corrosive implications upon the fields within which they moved according to the publics that they aggravated and irritated. So even though Wright is clearly celebrated as a novelist, a poet, an essayist, a critic, a short story writer, an activist, even a lyricist, uh, he appears here as a thinker of what he called terror in freedom, or post-mortem terror. Wright was an autodidact who reshaped what he called the Marxist instrumentalities. That is to say, Marxist concepts that were continually remolded to operate as a vocabulary that could shift between the modes of the psychological, the expressionist, the photographic, the ethnographic, and the fictional, in order to dramatize and personify the terror in freedom engendered by decolonization processes, which inhabit the painful temporalities between the no longer and the not yet. This is Sadia Hartman's temporality of the no longer and the not yet. In order to study ways in which Richard Wright invented aesthetic figures that were capable of narrating the times of lives that were lived and landscapes that were imagined as worlds that could no longer be a colony but were not yet a post-colony, perhaps semi-colonies in the words of Edward Kamau Braithwaite or perhaps neo-colonies, it's necessary to follow some threads. Follow them far enough, and it becomes clear that Wright's texts are better understood as mobilizations, as auto-mobilizations, as auto-vehicles, auto-catalyzers that are compulsive, cruel, heretical, exorbitant, enthusiastic, intrusive, impolite, impatient, and above all, unembarrassable. Wright is fascinated by embarrassment because embarrassment is the, embarrassment is a certain exposure that he endured in the deep south. A certain force field of embarrassment, shame, humiliation, and anger, which he learned to negotiate early on and which he was attuned to. When he goes to the Gold Coast with his cameras, he's especially attuned to the moments and the encounters that embarrass him. And because he has a, because he has a, ah, oh, is that all? Oh, I can do that. All right. Then. Oh, that's all it takes. So right when he goes to the Gold to Coast, he takes two cameras. He takes a Rolleiflex and he takes a Contax. And the Rolleiflex is that camera that you hold your waist, you know, and so he looks down. So you see these pictures in which people look at his eyes or they look at the Rolleiflex. Either they look at his waist or they look at his eyes. Uh, and all the photographs we chose are the ones where people are looking back at right i.e. they're either looking at his eyes or they're looking at his Rolleiflex. It's the split gaze. So what Wright's work does, what it makes possible, is that it exerts a significant, a significant pressure upon its context. That is to say, Wright's enthusiastic communism, embarrassed, American communism's positions on all of its questions. Wright's expressively capacious anti-communism unsettles the imperatives of other anti-communisms, 
even as it satisfies some of its edicts, it exceeds and it ignores others. It is a connective anti-communism that overlaps with the CCF, but is by no means containable by either. Rights Marxism, if that's the right word for it, and I think it is, offended most Marxists. His reports of encounters with Indonesian intellectuals in his account of the Asian African Conference managed to offend and outrage many of his hosts. And his account of the Gold Coast project of nationalism ensured that he was disinvited in advance from the independence celebrations of 1957. That's to say the right text engenders the wrong effects. It discomforts and embarrasses its settings. It is ill-fitting for the CCF magazines and the journals that continually attempted to claim his work. That's to say talking or thinking about rights complication of the political fiction that we call the global cultural Cold War would entail us thinking about the politics that he fictioned, the fictions that exceeded the politics of his fictions. In order for us to understand his critical interventions within and beyond the USA, Britain, Francoist Spain, the Gold Coast, Suharto's Indonesia, and Peronist Argentina, in order to dwell within the antagonisms, the antipathies, the antinomies, the alliances, the affinities, the complicities, the collusions, and the collaborations that struggle to make meaning and struggle to imagine a political order within the treacherous instabilities and inseparabilities of intracommunisms, of multiple fascisms, of conflicting anti-communisms, of warring socialisms, of competing black radical traditions, and of ever-expanding pan-African socialisms, it's necessary for us to return to the texts before black power, just to situate what's at stake in the book Black Power, although I think this earlier version, which he called Land of Pathos, or which he called Pathos of Distance, which he called Blood and Water, or Strange in a Strange Land, I think this is, this is one of his important works. So uh, what I want to do in the brief time I have is to sketch the outlines of Wright's aesthetic pol politics. Wright's aesthetic politics in their communist mode, in their anti-communist mode, and in their pan-Africanist socialist mode, all the while trying to hold their continuities and their discontinuities together, rather than assuming that the first gave way to the second, which gave way to the third, because I don't think they did. So our guide through this will be the theorist and the historian Cedric Robinson. Um, so Cedric Robinson, um, his great work, uh, Black Marxism, the Black Radical Tradition, is, uh, ends with a long section on Wright's 1954 book, The Outsider, which was written the same year, or was published the same year as Black Power. And Wright often talked about The Outsider while he was traveling through the Gold Coast. So these books were written in dialogue with each other, even though they seem so different. The Outsider is about this nihilistic young man called Damon Cross, this personification of, of a kind of intellectual nihilism. And Black Power is a, a singular book, an unclassifiable book, which is by no means reducible either to a travel journal, a travel book, or a memoir. And it's Cedric Robinson who really rethought Wright as a thinker in fiction, as a thinker who thought through aesthetic figures. 
And so it's, it's a couple of right, Cedric Robinson essays from 1978 and 1980, which really reoriented right beyond the kind of, beyond the kind of, a kind of immediately literary frame of protest, which is how he was understood, of course, via Baldwin. So Robinson points out that after Richard Wright resigned from the party in 42, although he formally left in 44, that one way to think about Wright's relation to communism is through an essay he wrote in 1940 called How Bigger Was Born. Uh, so that's an essay published for a magazine called the Saturday Review. And in this essay, he revisits his breakthrough book, Native Son. And he, he attempts, he's, he's theorizing, the, theorizing the role of the anti-hero, Bigger Thomas, who is understood as a personification and as a condensation, not so much of society or of classes or of races, but as a figure that bears the void of the anti-social. He's a figure that embodies a de-civilizing force, a force that de-symbolizes culture, that creates a culture of no culture. Bigger Thomas bears the negation of an anti-spiritual sustenance. He corrodes the capacity of culture to engender allegiance or to claim faith. So this is right, quote, the civilization which had given birth to Bigger Thomas contained no spiritual sustenance, had created no culture which could hold and claim his allegiance and faith, had sensitized him and had left him stranded, a free agent to roam the streets of our cities, a hot and whirling vortex of undisciplined and unchannelized impulses. So what Wright did was try to come up with a vocabulary for these new humans who could see no symbolic system, who could recognize no vocabulary, and whose role was to be a walking cyclone that turned around the conflict lines and across the conflict lines between fascism, between communism and between all the fascisms and communisms between. And right, what Wright did was to narrate what we would call, what we would now call a structure of feeling. A structure of feeling that cuts across the psychic infrastructures, the moral economies, and the racial hierarchies that support the conflict lines of racial capitalism as a form of settler colonialism, of state socialism and state fascism. Wright said, quote, I was fascinated by the similarity of the emotional tensions of bigger in America and bigger in Nazi Germany and bigger in old Russia. These are all bigger Thomases, white and black, tense, afraid, nervous, historical, sorry, hysterical. Certain modern experiences were creating types of personalities whose existence ignored racial and national lines of demarcation. And so Robinson turns to this essay to develop an argument in which Wright's characterization of a certain young black nihilism carries effects which are capable of putting pressure on communism, putting pressure on Marxism, putting pressure on the social as such. So instead of a communist reading of Bigger Thomas, what Cedric Robinson wants to do is to take the personification of Bigger Thomas and use that to, to undermine communism's guarantees and its self-understandings. Cedric Robinson writes, Wright was attempting to come to terms with the psychological consequence of a historical condition of which the leadership in the communist movement was only vaguely aware. 
if the masses could no longer recreate the social ideologies which had sustained them, then it would not be possible for them to fulfill the historical role that Marxist theory assigned them. Moreover, the fragmentation of personality, of social relations, an ideology that Wright observed and recreated was so total that its political and historical implications seriously challenged the presumptions of the communist movement. Wright dramatized the process by which the structure of feeling of black experience, not, narrated not empirically, but philosophically, philosophically and then fictionalized, puts pressure upon communism until its capacities for comprehension undergoes a process of refutation. And what is striking is that Wright is unembarrassed by the appeals of fascism. He doesn't chastise or denounce Bigger Thomas for being a figure that incarnates this appeal. It's the opposite. The fact that, the fact that there are satisfactions to be offered by fascism, the fact that fascism appeals to the generation of Bigger Thomas, who is 20, this is the measure or the test that communism is obliged to contest and to compete. Why can't communism offer satisfactions that can beat fascism? Why can't it do better? Why can't, what are communism's appeals? So instead of offering themselves up as a class whose allegiance to communism is guaranteed by their structure in the class system, it's the opposite. The black, proletariat, the black proletariat bear a force of unbelonging that corrodes American communism's understanding of itself as the natural home for all working classes. In this sense, all working classes become Negro insofar as they become unbound from their class. It's 1944. Richard Wright's essay, I Tried to Be a Communist, is published in the Atlantic Monthly. It's August. And then, as Anselm says, it's republished in the anti-communist volume, The God That Failed. Just to point out, that's Richard Wright holding, the, with the, uh, holding his, uh, his, uh, his hand at his belt. The woman in between is Dorothy Pizer. Dorothy Padmore, uh, and the, f the smiling fellow is George Padmore, um, real name Malcolm Nurse. Um, George Padmore is an ex-communist and an anti-communist, but not of the CPUSA, but of the third Comintern. Uh, between, 1930 and 19, between 1930 and 31, Padmore was based in Moscow, and between 31 and 34, who's based in Hamburg, and then the party, uh, the party shut him out. And then he became a socialist anti-communist, a pan-Africanist socialist anti-communist. But it's, it's still 19, it's still 1944, and Wright is the most famous African-American anti-communist in the English-speaking world. He's the single black presence in an all-male, all-white world, characterized by figures like Arthur Kersler and Ignacio Siloni, who are friends of his. And in his text, I Tried to Be a Communist, Wright tries to explain why he was drawn to communism in the first place. He says, my attention was caught by the similarity of the experience of workers in other lands, by the possibility of uniting a scattered but kindred people into a whole. Here at last, in the realm of revolutionary expression, Negro experience could find a home, a functioning value, a role. And this sociality of Marxism this fraternity of American communism 
is a proletarian solidarity. And Wright's role, as he thought, in his eight years in the party was to provide a language, to provide images that could give a meaning to this proletariat, that could give vision and task and motivation. And uh, Wright's aesthetic politics are captured right there. But what I find compelling about that essay, I Tried to Be a Communist, is that reading it brings with it Wright's entire body of work, which is to say the very fact that Wright became a communist entails an indictment of the Deep South from which the 19-year-old Wright, Wright leaves in order to flee, really, towards Chicago and towards Brooklyn. So that the recantation of a communism entails the question of why he was driven towards communism to begin with. And in doing so, it opens up the formulation of a totalitarianism that includes the long durée of racial slavery, the long durée of natal alienation, generalized dishonor, the social life of social death endured by the death-bound subject of African-American subjectivity in the Deep South. I think even more compelling than I Tried to Be a Communist is, is another novel that is a, it's, it's a novel that returns to the communist moment through expressionist personification. It's his novel, The Outsider, published in 54. The same is Black Power, and obviously just two years after Black Skin, White Masks, and two years after Invisible Man. These books are all in communication with each other, I think. So the Outsider is what Wright called an inquiry into the psychological condition of national oppression. And The Outsider can be read with black power, not because one is a non, so-called non-fiction text and one is a so-called novel. That's not as important as the fact that these books, along with Color Curtain, Pagan Spain, and White Man Listen, written, all published between 54 and 57. So that's five books in three years. These books confront what Cedric Robinson calls the leading ideas and ideational systems of contemporary Western political and social thought. Wright's arena was the totality of Western civilization and its constitutive elements, industrialization, urbanization, alienation, class, racism, exploitation, and the hegemony of bourgeois ideology. It's clear that Wright rearranged and re rearranged the elements that make up something like an existential phenomenology of Western developmentalism. Wright used novels to re-narrate the life with and the struggle through the crises he had encountered. The novel offered a way to pressure and to test the meanings and significances that he gave to those experiences. This is a way in which consciousness is indivisible from social theory. Social theory is indivisible from an experiment with ideology. Uh, so I'm reaching the end now. So in the essays White Man Listen from 1957, which are a series of lectures given in Scandinavia, Norway and Sweden, I think, Wright says the following. I maintain that the ultimate effect of white Europe upon Asia and Africa was to cast millions into a kind of spiritual void. I maintain that it suffused their lives with a sense of meaninglessness. I argue that it was not merely physical suffering or economic deprivation that has set over a billion and a half colored people in violent political motion. The dynamic concept of the void that must be filled, a void created by a thoughtless and brutal impact 
of the West upon a billion and a half people is more powerful than the concept of class conflict and more universal. So what's striking here is that we can immediately hear how right has intensified, extended, augmented and generalized the void of the social that was incarnated and personified by Bigger Thomas back in 1940. The civilization that corroded and conducts its corrosion across America has exceeded America. It had always exceeded America. It was never not global. But in 1957, what we can see is that across genres, across locations, across nations, Wright has maintained, intensified, and extended his concern with the processes of the void, of decivilization and desocialization, whose bewildering effects move across scales and ignore hierarchies and elude the political order that attempts to organize and symbolize sociality as such. The effort to formulate a vocabulary has persisted across 17 years. To conclude, 6th March 57, the day of independence for the nation state of Ghana. The culmination of a process that political scientists call political inst institutional transfer. A process that Ghana's first mass socialist party, the Convention People's Party, call self-government now. A process that has lasted seven years, from the first general election of 1950, in which the CPP, the Convention People's Party, beat their opponents, the National Liberation Movement of Ashanti, led by Wright's good friend, Joseph Appiah, who appears in the first version of the Black Power Draft, and who is defeated by Nkrumah, who is mentored by Wright's even closer friend, Padmore, who we saw earlier on. Padmore represents a socialist politics of anti-communism, dedicated to the deterritorialization of national borders in the project of the United States of Africa. Joseph Appiah represents an Ashanti aristocratic elitism dedicated to the retention of the chieftaincy system. Now this moment of Gold Coast's transformation is understood by many progressives, not least of all by Wright himself, as a kind of pilot project for the new Africa. In breaking the bond to Britain, Ghana is perceived by many to lead the way for the continent, to unleash a wave of transformation that will guide the rest of the continent, not only to independence, but to a seat at the table in the emerging post-colonial community. This transformation is not only political, but is entailed in its social, cultural, economic, and personal implications. It is a consciousness-raising enterprise. It is an ontological transformation. Yet Wright was not invited to the independence celebration. Even Richard Nixon was invited, <laughs> but Wright was not. And the reason he wasn't was because he was the first to visit the Gold Coast in 53. After Wright, a whole series of political scientists all arrived in the new state of Ghana, all working on the new discipline of the comparative study of new nations. They all call themselves modernization theorists rather than era study specialists. They all saw Ghana as a case study in political institutional transfer, as a laboratory for the building of neo verbarian concepts of charismatic authority. David Apter, Aristide Zolberg, Edward Schills, Henry Breton, David Austin, all men, all white American, all Ivy League. So a certain kind of American Africanism begins after Wright and forecloses Wright, whose name is never mentioned by any of these figures, nor is Padmore. And after Wright comes a second series 
of African-American artists and theorists and intellectuals, such as the lawyer Pauli Murray, an amazing woman whose biography was just published this year, the social scientist Claire, St. Clair Drake, the journalist Julian Mayfield, the educator Maya Angelou, the activist and head of Ghana's television studio, Shirley Graham Du Bois, and Du Bois himself, who at the age of 92 comes to Ghana to work on the renewed project of Encyclopedia Africana, a project that has taken the whole century, in which he will die before completing, but will hand over to Henry Louis Gates and the son of Joseph Appiah, Kwame Anthony Appiah. It is June 21st, 1953. It's midday. Wright has been in the Gold Coast for five days. He's visited two CPP rallies. He's gone to the Cape Coast. He's had conversations with Nkrumah. Things are going well. He takes his Rolleiflex and his contacts camera everywhere. And now he's in the International Club of Accra. It's midday. He's talking with writers and journalists and intellectuals. Ghanaians and British, Lebanese and Syrian, Egyptian and American. Figures such as Mabel Dove, who's well known for her 1934 novel, The Adventures of the Black Girl in her search for Mr. Shaw, which is a satirical and brilliant response to George Bernard Shaw's The Adventures of the Black Girl in her search for God. And as Wright says, the conversation drifts over the afternoon gin it drifts to the meaning of the global tide of industrialization that is now sweeping the earth. And one Englishman, Wright does not say who it is, suggests that it was remarkable how right Hitler was and how we, the Allies, are now going to rearm Germany to do the job that we didn't let her do then. And how Hitler didn't really like, dislike the Jews. He just used them to unify his nation. To which Wright replies, I pointed out that such a method of unifying a nation was rather costly when six million Jews had to pay for it with their lives, and there loomed a project for the extermination of the Poles. I pointed out that I had written a book about the plight of modern man in the midst of industrial society, and that this plight was now the general heritage of all mankind, and that the real problem was what could be done to give man a place again on earth, when industrialization had cut him loose and made him an atom. I pointed out that the need that Hitler sought to fill, that is, to give modern man some kind of emotional identification, was truly a cryingly valid need, but that his method was all the more criminal for his applying such a foolish solution of racism. And then Wright adds this, Coda. He says the conversation was most instructive, but strikingly enough, no one sought to apply what we were talking about to the Convention People's Party. The English man who was praising Hitler did not seem to realize that the same emotion, lost and whirling futilely in the human heart, was being organized in a new, daring, and different way by Kwame Nkrumah. And there, in that figure of emotion, there's a futility that turns, a futility that whirls, that loses its place. That figure speaks back to 1940, to the figure of Bigger Thomas, as a vortex that whirls. And then Wright draws the implications. The CPP must be placed in a context beyond the realities of the Gold Coast. Can the CPP appeal to people like him, to men like him, who have no ideas to live by, except for the idea that ideas are no longer any guide? And this is what Wright means by the reality of nihilism, a reality in which it was important to grasp the idea that no ideas are really important. This is to say Wright brought the nihilism with him he brought the nihilism that he was looking for a vocabulary for. And he thought the CPP could provide the vocabulary to re-narrate the nihilism, to re-narrate the void. 
but perhaps the CPP saw the void without the vocabulary. And perhaps the two could not communicate and could not meet. And just as Alexander's point that India was positioned as a laboratory, as a case study, the careless supposition of laboratory life, so too Ghana was positioned as a case, as a problem, as a way to model a future. I don't think that's what Wright entirely intended, but it wouldn't be the first time Wright was heard as such, because in Wright, the corrosive and the engendering, the vortex and the void, were indivisible. Okay, thank you. <laughs>